We have a potential launch date for Starship's next flight right as the rocket completes its wet dress rehearsal. Europe is cooking rockets and ISS cargo missions. SpaceX launched a first of its kind mission for the US government. And what on earth happened at McGregor yesterday? It's Friday the 24th of May and there's much more to come this week in Space Flight. This week we've had major news coming from Europe on very different fronts. Let's start off with a rocket debut, Ariane 6's debut. This rocket has had a quite a troubled development, but it's very close to launch. All rocket parts and payloads set to fly on this maiden flight are already at French Guiana, and this week ESA announced it had narrowed down the launch period for this first flight to the first two weeks of July. You may remember from a few episodes ago that Ariane 6's main rocket stages have been assembled already at the launch site. Well, the last piece needed to go onto the rocket now is the fairing with the mission's payloads. ESA hopes to carry that out in the next couple of weeks during early June. Once that's complete, this first flight-ready Ariane 6 rocket will undergo a wet dress rehearsal on the pad. That test, currently scheduled for June 18th, will test the propellant load sequence once again and will be the last major test of the rocket ahead of launch. So hopefully, after many delays and development troubles, Europe may finally have an active heavy lift launcher in just a few weeks from now. Another piece of news that dropped this week was the first flight assignments for Europe's latest group of astronauts. The announcement came as part of the Space Council between the European Union and the European Space Agency, celebrated in Belgium. You may remember we recently covered the graduation of the latest group of ESA astronauts. Well, two of them, Sophie Adeno and Raphael Ligeois, have been selected to be the first ones of their group to fly on a long-duration flight on board the International Space Station. Both are set to fly to the station in 2026, with Sophie going up first in early 2026 and Raphael going second in the summer or fall of 2026. The two astronauts have already begun their ISS training and are currently hard at work at NASA's Johnson Space Center. But very soon, it won't be just the European astronauts going to the station. This week, ESA has announced the winners of its own contract for commercial cargo to the ISS. The winners are Tails Alenia Space and the Exploration Company. This comes after about six months since the agency opened up the competition, fast-tracking the study proposals in order to move into more complex stages of the program much quicker. Both the Exploration Company and Tails Alenia Space offer a capsule shape as the solution to deliver and return cargo to and from the ISS, something not very surprising. Now, while this might not seem like a big deal, the hope is that ESA could eventually move into a commercial crew program just like NASA did after setting up a commercial resupply program. If you thought the European space news ended there, you're wrong. Of course, there's more. Earlier this week, we got news about ESA's ExoMars 2028 mission, which aims to put a European rover on the Martian surface. ESA and NASA have both signed an agreement in which both agencies will collaborate on the ExoMars 2028 mission. This agreement will see NASA providing the launch services to ESA, radio isotope heater units and propulsion elements for the rover's landing. This is a major life-saving moment for the project after it had been put on hold following Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2022. Both the launcher and lander for the mission had originally been built in Russia, but after that happened, ESA cut ties with Russia and decided to find another way to proceed with the mission. Lo and behold, two years later, the agency has found a trusted partner in NASA, which means that the Rosalind Franklin rover will have a lot more chances to land on Mars by 2028, hence the name, ExoMars 2028. Starship is edging ever closer to its next launch. This week, Ship 29 and Booster 11 completed a wet dress rehearsal on the launch pad at Starbase in preparation for the fourth flight of the world's most powerful rocket. That flight might even happen just eight days from now on June 1st. We've started to see the usual trickle of hints that we use to guess when the next flight of Starship might happen. We made a video about that if you want to watch it a long time ago, I think it was for Flight 2. As part of this long list of items we've seen, there are no road closures for flight for June 1st, 2nd and 3rd at the usual midnight to 2pm central road closure window that we've seen for previous flights. We also now have a local notice to mariners indicating the flight also planned for June 1st and at least as of the time of recording, we've started to see the first NOTAM for the re-entry area, which confirms Starship will be re-entering over the Indian Ocean like on the previous flight. 
That being said, it's likely that by the time you're watching, there are even more indications or perhaps even an official confirmation from SpaceX. Of course, those things like to go out just as we finish recording this week in spaceflight every week. It always happens. Now, while a flight might happen next week, it seems like the wet dress rehearsal that SpaceX had carried out ahead of this flight might not have gone as well as planned. During the Starship wet dress rehearsal, SpaceX runs through the entire countdown sequence up until the start of the deluge system at T-10 seconds. While in general the test did not seem to go wrong or anything, it is true that we didn't see the usual signs of the countdown reaching that T-10 second end point. Think for example about the activation of the detonation suppression system at around the T-25 second mark. On top of the flight closures for next week, Cameron County posted another set of road closures for May 28th, 29th and 30th that go from 5am to 5pm central, the same window used for the wet dress rehearsal that took place last week. This seems to indicate that a repeat of this test may happen no earlier than May 28th, followed shortly on June 1st by the actual launch itself. It's not just technical readiness that's needed ahead of launch though, SpaceX is still awaiting the FAA's approval of a safety determination that would not necessitate the completion of the Flight 3 mishap investigation and a launch license modification. These items could come out literally the day before the planned launch date and SpaceX could still launch just fine. That means if you want to go watch this launch, maybe start making plans for it, but try to be flexible, just in case. By the way, just as a bonus piece of news as Alex was finishing up this script, just as we were producing this video, we got treated by a spectacular anomaly at the McGregor tripod stand. It looks like the Raptor being tested is shut down and it shuts down hard. Then the result of that creates another secondary explosion soon after. It's definitely quite a yikes, as some might put it, but it's also worth noting that, at least, this is happening on a test stand and not during flight attached to a Starship vehicle. We already know how bad that looked, especially on Flight 1. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. Sierra Space's first Dream Chaser spacecraft has arrived at the Kennedy Space Center. After years of development and months of environmental and vibration testing at NASA's Glenn Research Center, Tenacity is finally at its launch site, preparing for launch. The space plane arrived on May 18th and was transferred into the Space Systems Processing Facility, where it will be undergoing several months of pre-launch preparations. Part of the final pre-launch processing will involve the mating of Tenacity with its Shooting Star Cargo Module, which arrived at the KSC just a few days earlier on May 11th. Both Tenacity and Shooting Star will be carrying a combined 3,500 kilograms of cargo to the International Space Station on the spacecraft's first flight to the orbiting outpost. The launch is currently being targeted for October of this year, but there's a good chance it slips a few months as the engineers put the final touches on the first Dream Chaser and NASA clears it for launch. Of course, as you may know, that first launch of Dream Chaser is set to take place on the second flight of United Launch Alliance's Vulcan Centaur rocket. This week, the company's CEO, Tori Bruno, shared progress on the future parts for this rocket, including the first stage booster and Centaur upper stage. Based on these pictures, ULA has a great deal of hardware for upcoming flights, going all the way to Flight 22. It seems like the company also has completed boosters for the next two or three flights of Vulcan, albeit with a very distinct lack of BE-4 engines. We can even identify which boosters are for which missions by looking at the mounts for the solid rocket boosters already installed on the Vulcan first stage. This one, for example, has three mounts on this side, indicating it will carry a total of six SRBs, and it is very likely to be precisely for the first flight of Dream Chaser. Compare that to the one further away from the picture, which only has one mount, indicating it'll carry only two SRBs. This one most likely set to fly the GPS-3 SV-07 mission early next year. You can even notice that the paintwork on the booster is different between them, perhaps indicating Vulcan will sport different decals for different types of missions. This was definitely quite an interesting status update. Starlink has announced this week it has crossed the 3 million customer mark, bringing the project closer to economic success. Just a mere couple of months ago, SpaceX had reported reaching 2.7 million customers, meaning that the company has been growing its customer base at a rate of about 150,000 customers per month. This is an increase from the approximately 100,000 customers per month that Starlink was receiving by the end of 2023. 
with more and more countries now allowing Starlink services and an increase in the launch cadence and therefore the amount of satellites launched, it's no doubt that Starlink's customer growth is probably linked to that. Unfortunately, there is no public record of SpaceX's finances, but safe to say that, as Jack would say, more customers, more better. Now let's take a look at the space traffic over the last week and what's coming up next week in spaceflight. Once again, SpaceX has broken yet another reusability record with its Falcon 9 rocket. This week in launches started off with a Falcon 9 taking flight from Florida on May 18th at 032 UTC. One could have said this was your ordinary Starlink launch as it was carrying yet another batch of Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. But this mission marked the 21st flight of booster B1062, which made it the first Falcon booster to fly that many times, pushing the limits of Falcon 9 reusability. The booster flew its 20th flight just about a month ago, that flight in particular becoming the first booster to reach 20 flights, and with this launch it has pushed that number just a little bit further. As is usual for this booster, it successfully returned to Earth, landing on SpaceX's drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas. The launch took place right after sunset, giving fantastic views of the jellyfish effect to those in the area, and of course our live stream as well. This week, Blue Origin's new Shepard rocket returned to the skies with people on board after almost two years of pause due to the in-flight failure during the NS-23 mission. Liftoff of the new Shepard NS-25 mission took place on May 19th at 1435 UTC from Blue Origin's Launch Site 1 in Van Horn, Texas. On board the capsule were six passengers, Mason Angel, Sylvain Chiron, Kenneth Hess, Carol Shaler, Gopi Thotakura and Ed Dwight, all flying for the first time. We had talked about these six people in an earlier episode and precisely pointed out that Ed Dwight had the first opportunity to be the first black astronaut candidate, but unfortunately he was never able to fly into space. With the NS-25 mission, Ed can now say he was at least in space even if only for a few minutes and he also got to take the record for being the oldest person in space, surpassing William Shatner's record. This mission also marks the successful return to human flight for New Shepard after the aforementioned NS-23 failure and after it had successfully performed a cargo flight on the NS-24 mission last year. The flight wasn't entirely without a hitch though. During the capsule's descent, one of the three main parachutes did not fully inflate. While the capsule is designed to land softly even with one parachute off, Blue Origin has already indicated it is investigating why this parachute didn't fully inflate, something that would be very obvious for anyone in or outside the company if we're being honest. The booster, tail number 4, had more luck and was capable of landing on the landing pad without any problems. This week we also had the launch of a Chengzheng 2D taking place on May 20th at 0306 UTC from Launch Complex 9 at the Taiyan Satellite Launch Center in China. The rocket was carrying four Beijing 3C remote sensing satellites into sun-synchronous orbit. For this flight, the first stage of the Chengzheng 2D was carrying four aerodynamic grid fins for a more precise control of its impact point. Not only they get to not crash on a village, but they also test potential reusability technology. It's a win-win. The following day, we had a Kuaizhou 11 lifting off on May 21st at 0415 UTC from Site 95A at the Zhou Chen Satellite Launch Center. The Kuaizhou 11 was carrying four satellites into sun-synchronous orbit. These satellites are the Wuhan-1, Chushan-001, Tainyan-22, and Ling-K-301. This is the first launch of a Kuaizhou rocket since January. The second Falcon 9 launch of the week took place from Vandenberg on May 22nd at 0800 Universal Time. This one was carrying out the NROL-146 mission for the National Reconnaissance Office. This mission was the first of the NRO's proliferated space architecture satellite constellation. With this architecture, the NRO aims to satisfy its needs in a new and innovative way, a way that we're now used to, but that had never been tried before by the US government, and that is mega constellations. Up until now, the traditional way for the military, be it the Air or Space Force or the NRO, to operate in space was to order and launch big monolithic satellites either into low Earth orbit or geosynchronous Earth orbit. Under that paradigm, the main advantage is that each satellite can be tailored to the mission at hand and carry out a lot of different activities with just one single satellite. However, this kind of approach makes these satellites vulnerable to a foreign attack, to jamming, and makes it easier to spy since there's only one. 
The new and innovative way makes use of multiple, much smaller satellites in different orbits, rather than a single big one in a single orbit to perform various similar tasks, making it more resilient against enemy attack. This is what is known as the proliferated space architecture. Now, whilst this is a first for the NRO, it is not entirely the first time for the whole of the US government. The Space Development Agency, under the wing of the Space Force, already started its life with this kind of proliferated space architecture approach. The agency has plans for multiple different constellations called tranches that have many different satellites performing different tasks under what it calls layers. However, the NRO is carrying this out in much more secrecy. The Space Development Agency publicly announces the purposes of each of the tranches and layers, the satellite contractors for each of the satellites, its launch plans, and even pictures of the stack of satellites. All we know officially about this NRO launch is that it is the first out of six the agency is planning for 2024, and that many more are expected to come until 2028. Unofficially though, it's been reported that this launch and all of those remaining are carrying Starshield satellites, the military version of SpaceX's Starlink satellite. These satellites would be carrying special payloads built and created by Northrop Grumman, with the whole program totaling $3 billion in cost. Unfortunately, as of the time of recording, we don't know how many satellites were launched on this mission, but given the satellites are heavily based off Starlink satellites, it's very likely the number is about 20. For this mission, SpaceX used booster B-1071, which had already flown two previous NRO missions at the start of its life. Its 16th launch and landing went well, landing on the deck of Of Course I Still Love You. Notice the legs were a little bit lower this time around and after landing. You can bet SpaceX will be utilising those legs' self-levelling mechanisms. Let's go now to the third Falcon 9 launch of the week with the Starlink Group 662 mission. Liftoff took place on May 23rd at 0235 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The first stage, B-1080, was flying for an eighth time, and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas. Wrapping up the week, we had just yesterday night the launch of the fourth Falcon 9 rocket of the week, carrying another batch of Starlink V2 mini-satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage for this mission, B-1077, successfully touched down on the deck of Just Read the Instructions, who returns to SpaceX's recovery fleet following a week and a half of dry dock maintenance. With the Starlink launches this week, SpaceX has now launched a total of 6,505 satellites into orbit, of which 439 have re-entered and 5,238 have moved into their operational orbits. Going into next week, we have Electron's Ready Aim Pre-Fire mission, which has been delayed due to unfavourable weather. The launch has now been reset for May 25th, within the one-hour launch window opening at 0715 UTC. After that, we'll have a Falcon 9 launch with the Starlink Group 660 mission from Florida. The four-hour launch window is set to open on May 27th at 11.30 UTC. That's early. And from SpaceX's West Coast launch site, we'll have the launch of ESA's EarthCare satellite on another Falcon 9 rocket. The launch is planned to take place on May 28th at 22.20 UTC, with the booster set to return back to land for this mission, so if you're near the launch site, watch out for the triple sonic booms. Off the coast of China, we'll have the launch of a Ceres 1S rocket carrying a yet unknown payload. The 50 minute launch window is set to open on May 29th at 0800 UTC. Going out to Kazakhstan, we'll have the launch of the next Progress cargo spacecraft to the ISS. Liftoff atop its Soyuz 2.1A rocket is set to take place on May 30th at 0943 UTC. Progress MS-27 will then take about two days to reach the station, with a docking plan for June 1st at 11.47 UTC. And you might have heard the news, Starliner has been delayed even further to the right. Liftoff has now been rescheduled for June 1st at 16.25 UTC, with docking to the ISS set for June 2nd at 18.13 UTC. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. I've been Ryan Caton for NSF at our UK meetup in Leicester, as you can see behind me, and we'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.